Can we, uh, before we have uh, three sounds of the bell, I'd like to ask us to uh, sing a song to... The, the hall is already getting quite warm. But maybe we can sing, I have arrived, I am home, together. I have arrived, I am home in the here and in the now. I have arrived, I am home in the here and in the now. I am solid, I am free, I am solid, I am free. In the ultimate I dwell, the ultimate I dwell. Je suis chez moi, je suis arrivé, il n'y a qu'ici et maintenant, bien solide, vraiment libre, je prends refuge en moi-même. Je suis chez moi, je suis arrivé, il n'y a qu'ici et maintenant, bien solide, vraiment libre, dans la tête je m'établis. Let's enjoy uh, three sounds of the bell, coming, finding our true home, finding ourselves here in Lower Hamlet with the Sangha, feeling uh, the gratitude uh, as we had in the guided meditation. Good morning, dear Thai, uh, dear Sangha. And this morning we are together in the Assembly of Stars Meditation Hall in Lower Hamlet. It's the 27th of December, 2017, and we're um, in our festive period, in our holiday, Christmas and New Year weeks, a very special time 
in the world and also we make it so in Plum Village. Uh, we, we love to celebrate um, the spirit of Christmas and what is um, often termed the kind of spirit of Christmas is the spirit of peace and joy coming together in a spirit of peace and joy and so that is I've given myself that as the theme for the for the talk this morning and joy maybe mostly about joy <laughs> so hopefully it will be a, a joyful talk a joyful experience together and And we're talking about uh, the kind of joy that goes along with peace. You know, sometimes we get uh, the joy of um, the excited joy, uh, maybe the kind of joy at a party or something. Um, we maybe get alcohol and get very frothy. Sometimes even in, in the, the, the residence, uh, the brothers say, oh, there's too much brotherhood and joy drinking, but we're drinking tea together. <laughs> Not alcohol, but the conversation is, can be quite light and fun, you know, and we're not deep enough sometimes. So I, I was thinking it's like a cappuccino with a lot of froth. But the froth can be very, very nice, you know, it'd be a shame if you didn't have some froth on your cappuccino. But at some point you want to taste the coffee, you, know? <laughs> you want to get down to that coffee. <laughs> so when we, when we enjoy being together, uh, we are joyful and we enjoy being light together. We enjoy a bit of froth, but we also want to really be together at a more, uh, maybe a deeper, more profound way and touch uh, our spiritual connection. So we are spiritual friends together. And as again the guided meditation pointed to, um, we, we know we're very blessed to be able to come together um, and be together and practice together. It makes the atmosphere very cozy and we support each other somehow in the practice. So somehow um, we make Plum Village our home. For some of us, we, we really live here uh, year in, year out, month in, month out, month out, and some we come and we make it our home for this Christmas week or for the holiday time. And uh, we, however long or short, uh, but we all feel we are at home together. So having a place to be having a refuge to be together, to practice together is a real condition for, for joy. Having some, some food, sometimes very good food, it's also a condition. that peace and joy is considered a kind of the spirit of Christmas. We sometimes, in, on the Christmas Eve sharing, we had the, the hymns, uh, Joy to the World. And we, there's another hymn, I think, uh, Peace on Earth and Mercy Mild. So we have that, we know that we want to offer joy, not just to this, this one or that one, but we want joy for the whole world. And that's a very wonderful um, 
aspiration, the wonderful thought that there could be joy for the world. And also in our uh, Plum Village Buddhist chants, sometimes we chant um, being truly present, that's the, uh, and the, the, the truly, being truly present chant has the expression um, may it be found that in the world there is no place at war. May the winds be favorable, the rain seasonable, and the people's hearts at peace. So we, we offer that thought, that wish. And we know that uh, there are many places um, in the world that are where there is war, uh, where there is oppression, we know that uh, we would like to imagine a world where there was peace, where there was joy to the world, where there was less greed and um, less anger, these things. And somehow we know that it's part of our work to contribute to that, to that world. We, we know we have our part to play to bring more peace and joy into the world. So we know that uh, if we can generate peace and joy in us, we have something to offer and gradually there will be more peace and joy in the world. And this is partly what we come here for to, to Plum Village. It's also what we do in Plum Village. By the way we uh, set up the schedule, the way we do things together, we want to generate the peace and the joy for ourselves and f for uh, as an offering to the world. being able to take a moment to stop and breathe is a, a good condition for us to touch joy in the present moment. So I'm just doing that now. Even there can be some anxiety, even there can be some suffering if we're able to stop and pause, come back to our in-breath and our out-breath, we can be with what is and we're able to um, be present for ourselves. then even with some anxiety or some suffering, we can touch joy in the present moment. I'd like to ask for a sound of the bell. Many of us uh, can remember the first time we encountered uh, our teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, through his teaching. Maybe uh, for some of us, we first saw Thai in Plum Village 
uh, teaching or we read a book or maybe we encountered Thai through the Sangha. He wasn't <laughs> here as an individual but he was here in his Sangha body in his, the community that he uh, created. For me, I have many special moments where I can say, I, sort of meeting Thai at different times. And I was living in Scotland. And um, so there was the time when I first um, read a book of Thai, Miracle of Mindfulness. And then there was, shortly after, there was a time where I first heard Thai's, Thai speaking, but it was on a very poor quality cassette tape. We don't have them now. You know? um, and I had a cassette tape player in my Fiat Uno that I used to drive to work I lived on the way to Arbroath in Scotland. <laughs> and I... Uh, remember I put this tape that somebody had given me uh, at a party <laughs> because they'd heard that I was into Buddhism and into Thich Nhat Hanh. <laughs> it was a frothy party with alcohol and but I was given this tape, oh I heard that you liked uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and I was said oh thank you and then I put the tape, I was on my way to work and uh, as I listened to this voice, I realized he, it was commanding a kind of attention from me. And I had to stop. And I stopped in a service station and I parked the car so that I could listen to Thai clearly. And as I say, it was the very first time. And in his voice, I found embodied these extraordinary qualities of a kind of human potential that I, I didn't know really, I hadn't encountered before. Embodying compassion, wisdom. And um, also something of a sense of humor but this depth um, and power was palpable. I, I heard it in the voice and I was very, I'd already enjoyed this book, but uh, this was the moment where I realized I'd found, without n even having the concept, I'd found a teacher in the world. And I, re I really had no concept of, of that before. So I was very moved and perhaps the first words I heard him share were on this subject of peace and joy. He, he's, Tai asked the question, what is more important than peace and the immediate answer came up in my mind nothing of course nothing is more important than having peace we all know that we you know without peace we're in trouble and we we need peace as we've in the world we need peace i'm not sure if i totally even at that point understood the concept of inner peace <laughs> but I knew that peace was important so I asked the uh, rhetorical question what is more important than peace and I suppose as I say I was expecting nothing nothing is more important but Tai answered what is more important than having peace is having the capacity to enjoy that peace. <laughs> because if you do not 
have the capacity to enjoy peace, then even the conditions for peace are there. Even you are offered peace. You will throw it away. And so it, it sort of hit me like a freight train. <laughs> like, whoa, that's powerful. And it puts the responsibility right back to me. I realized immediately that means we have to cultivate the capacity to enjoy peace. So I share that experience um, and it is to highlight the connection in some sense between peace and joy. We may sometimes think they're separate things and also to show how central, how important it is this factor of joy, how central to life and to the teaching of Buddhism that we cultivate joy in our hearts, in our minds, in our body. There's a book um, that I haven't read. I've read other books by this man, C.S. Lewis, he's a Christian. But the book was of the ti- had the title "Surprised by Joy." And sometimes we do experience that. Right? Somehow conditions are sufficient, and joy arises, quite by, takes us by surprise, and it's a wonderful experience. In uh, we can sometimes say it's a moment of grace or something. It's just the joy de vivre, just the joy of life. And these can be very real experiences. But in the um, Buddhist tradition, in the, what we call the practice, we don't want to leave it to chance that we experience joy. We want to uh, make those conditions uh, make those conditions available to us and cultivate joy, something like on purpose, intentionally produce joy, nourishing joy in us. The joy. that can be then a kind of energy available for us to have balance and have the energy to embrace our suffering and to be able to uh, help other people, to offer to other people. So, Plum Village is, is, as I say, f- somewhat for that. You know, cultiva- it's a field of cultivating joy for ourselves, as well as, you know, of course we talk about suffering. I remember I, uh, somebody said, what will your talk be on? And I said, peace and joy. And I said, probably it will come round to suffering at some point. When we're suffering a lot, um, we sometimes talk about needing to touch joy in us to balance. We build an island. If we're overwhelmed, we're drowning in our suffering. We build an island of, of practice, of mindfulness. And even in the darker times, we we hope to be able, it's very helpful if we can touch joy. Sometimes through 
uh, a friend comes and helps us with their stability and they're able to say something humorous in the moment and it can bring us out. We touch that joy again. In the um, 14 mindfulness trainings, we have the seventh mindfulness training, which is uh, so right at the center of the 14. Tai gave the image of uh, somebody carrying two heavy weights, maybe buckets of water, on a bamboo pole, oh, and the shoulders are like the, the center point, which allows this heavy weight to be carried, balanced, either side. So the 14 mindfulness trainings, they're guiding our life and they're inviting us to take care of our anger. Number six is taking care of our anger. They're inviting us to touch suffering in order to cultivate compassion. They're inviting us to show up for the world, not to run away from suffering and to speak out in situations. And they're inviting us to live responsibly. And sometimes that can feel quite a heavy you know, burden. So it's a bit like, but it's a burden we want to take. So the center point, the place where we can balance, is this seventh mindfulness training, which is inviting us to, to touch uh, the nourishing and healing elements in us and around us. And it's saying that as part of your life, we, we, we have to give a central place to nourishing ourselves with joy being in nature and uh, yeah, touching the, the practice of dwelling happily in the present moment. This winter retreat, the theme, there's been a theme of the seven factors of awakening and joy is one of the factors. So, yeah. Let's talk about that a bit. So we have the, the seven factors, I'll just list them. We can say of awakening or enlightenment. I think Sister Twainian prefers enlightenment. Where she shared on the subject of the um, investigating the dharmas. So we have the seven factors, they are mindfulness, investigation of the dharmas, a phenomena that can include your suffering, <laughs> can it also include your joy. So mindfulness investigation is energy or diligence sometimes and joy comes number four. And after that we have ease, which you could say has a sense of peace, a sense of ease in our body, in our mind. Concentration. And finally, uh, letting go, or equanimity, upeksha. So joy here is, has the um, Pali term, piti. And as a factor of awakening, 
as a factor of enlightenment, we can see that if we have joy, we already have some enlightenment. It's not like stepping stones, one, seven stepping stones, and then maybe you touch some enlightenment. The joy is already contains within itself some enlightenment. When we, for instance, give attention to a good condition, like I am alive, here I am standing here together with you, and I touch uh, the energy of life in me, and I can touch the joy to be alive, right? So I'm enlightened to the miracle of life, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on my practice, right? So touching the fact that I am alive and the joy that arises from that is the enlightenment energy. Paying attention to good conditions can give rise to joy and the we become enlightened that we have that good condition and we're in touch with it in such a way that joy and of course gratitude uh, is born. And joy very much uh, goes along with, with energy, um, that kind of energy that comes from the practice of uh, mindfulness. Mindfulness we pay attention to, we hold in our awareness. Um, the object of our awareness may be, as I say, a, a good condition. <coughs> and by looking into that good condition, we get this energy and we get this joy. And it can lead to a sense of, of ease. And this joy also gives us the energy we need to concentrate and it's a cycle, it can go further. And then this letting go, you know, letting go of that which is blocking us from our joy, from our ease, from our peace. I want to uh, go further with this and connect it also to the, f the four limitless minds. But first I want to ask a question um, about joy. And maybe the question is, what is joy? Some words from you that you may associate with, with joy. Um, that, yeah, how joy expresses itself in you, around you, how it shows up for you, what, what words may come to mind when you think of joy. Smiling? Okay, a smile. Hmm? A, a, a pleasant emotion? No. Yeah. A pleasant emotion. Happiness, yeah. Gratitude. Yeah, so space, inner space. Are you alive? So we have this already with the touching, the joy of life. So aliveness. Is that a good way to say? Sharing. Hmm? Sharing. 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 Yeah, being able to share. Love. Laughter. Love. Yes, I got it. <laughs> uh, love. Yeah. Hmm? Lightness. Lightness. Yeah. Very good. Belonging. 
Hmm? Warmth. Okay. It goes with kind of warmth of love, warmth, sort of around here. Yeah. Understanding. Understanding. Understanding also goes with love. Freedom. <laughs> okay. Okay. Freshness, maybe within a space. Reverence. Yes. yes. Okay. Connection. Connection. Yeah. <laughs> Chocolate. Okay. <laughs> So with pleasure we have eating, sleeping, <laughs> chocolate, okay, <laughs> and coffee, <laughs> sorry, beauty, beauty. okay, Courage. right, say that's open heart? yeah, open heart, uh, <laughs> okay. I'm going I'm going I'm going to run out of space shortly and somebody wanted to offer can I, can I share something um, I had I had, a, I had two moments of what I thought was joy at Plum Village and I analyzed it and I thought what it was it was an absence an absence of regrets right and an very good aspirations at the same time okay so the joy that comes from the absence of um, regret. regret and aspiration, you said? Yeah. So it's a kind of aimlessness, like not grasping for something outside. Absence of craving, absence. Absence of craving. yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yes, excitement goes along with chocolate. I think. <laughs> um, and comfort. So there are some that are more connected with the sense pleasures, and of course, maybe more the froth of the cappuccino. And I'm, which is, as I say, is can be tasty, but we want we're going for the deeper uh, aspects of joy and the joy that goes along with the practice and helps us uh, in the direction of transforming our suffering and not just giving us a place of comfort to kind of avoid suffering. So that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing these other ones. And as you see, we have a beautiful uh, smorgasbord <laughs> a lot of different flavors and aspects to joy that we can... So when we talk about joy, we, we realize that we're talking about many, many other things besides. And in fact, if you put the word peace in the center, maybe there would be a lot of common words, I would imagine. Right? That would fit with the same. Yeah. So you'd say, what is peace? It would be there too. I like the, the word smile because it reminds me to smile and it reminds me that uh, it is a practice to smile. You know, we have the, the gata, waking up this morning, I smile. 24 brand new hours before me, I vow to live fully in each moment and look upon all beings with the eyes of compassion. And so this is inviting us to generate joy as we wake up. And we're maybe in touch with some grumpiness. 
but we're asked to change the peg, change the CD, and say, mm, I can touch joy in this moment uh, right away. So that's why we said, you know, not leaving it to chance, the joy, but cultivating it. You know, it's sometimes said that joy, our disposition, our sort of level, baseline level of joy, is set somewhat by our genetics. So some of us just get lucky and we get a genetic uh, uh, card that says, yeah, you're going to have a lot of joy in your life. You're going to be a joyful person. And another person gets to be miserable. <laughs> that sounds pretty, pretty unfair. That's unjust. <laughs> but that's why the, we're so lucky when we find the practice and we realize, well, whatever we were given, we can increase by the practice. We can generate joy and we can change our baseline level of joy. We don't have to stay stuck uh, with what we think we are or what our genetics gave us. And uh, this is very possible to touch joy and cultivate joy. And it's an maybe an underrated practice. Maybe in ourselves we, we say, oh, joy, that's something superficial. But as we can see, when we put these kinds of words to it, it's not something so superficial, and it is something important. And as I was pointing to, it has to do with our suffering as well. It has to do with the suffering in the world as well. You know, even in the darkest places, uh, like I'm in touch with uh, people in Liberia, they've gone through such hell, 15 years of civil war, but they still know how to touch joy. And sometimes we feel, oh, I cannot feel joyful because there is so much suffering in the world. But that's not helping. And it's not um, what it, and it is helpful to generate the joy, but not losing the awareness of the suffering. And knowing that that joyful energy is part of the, the kind of energy that comes from the practice and can, we can hold you know, something big, some big suffering with that kind of energy in our heart and we can be with it and we can generate compassion and understanding and love. So thank you for, for sharing all of those. I'm going to, because of the space on the board, I'm going to take it off and go on to a separate thing. But right now I'm still caught with this word smile. And I'd like to just do an experiment. I was told that scientifically, when you smile, you feel happy. And so I would invite you all to close your eyes so you don't feel self-conscious. Uh, I promise I won't look. <laughs> and bring a smile to your face. And make it a generous smile. Really offering yourself a lot of hearty appreciation and love. Here I am, a smile. And breathing in, breathing out. Notice with that smile, your mind is very conducive to your mind being happy, correct? <laughs> you experience that way? Well, okay, if not, if you're still skeptical, and you should be because we're scientists, right? Let's try the opposite. I'm not sure if I can do it. I'm too, <laughs> I'm too joyful. Um, try putting on a really grumpy face. Clo you can close your eyes again. Like, I really just... Ah, uh, it's not going to work, there's too much joy in the house. <laughs> but I did try it for myself last night. I thought I would try it. And uh, it, it's amazing how just your facial expression can affect your mood. You know? So when you, when you have a grumpy face, grumpy mind. Happy face, 
happy mind. It's crazily simple, you know, like, it's, it's um, so sometimes smiling is the practice. We don't feel like smiling, but we smile even though we're not quite there yet, and it can help. And of course it can help to have, a, have an object um, of a good condition, like I am alive, or my mother's alive, or my friend is here, to remind us of our gratitude, to make the smile more real. You know, that, that there's a real uh, reason we're smiling. We give ourselves a good reason to smile. And it can, can liven us up. So when we notice our, we're down in the dumps, we can take action and generate uh, a moment of joy, of appreciation. And lots of small moments of joy, lots of small moments of appreciation turn into a big joy, a big gratitude like drops in the bucket. And if joy is a factor of enlightenment, and it is enlightenment itself to a measure, then lots of drops, and we get the big enlightenment. So we have small drops of enlightenment turn into a big one. Okay. Take a snapshot in your mind of all of that. Laughter, love and understanding, lightness, warmth, belonging, beauty, freedom, Stillness, aliveness. I'm going to um, actually in Buddhism, Thai would often teach um, a teaching. I don't know exactly where it came, but it was sources of joy, and he would we would put uh, peace joy and happiness together. The peace, joy and happiness born from mindfulness concentration and insight. And letting go. Um, so usually, I don't, it must have come from the, the Chinese canon because Thai would always put the Chinese characters by these. So there was, uh, um, I might ask somebody, I could try, I tried it last night, something like, um, somebody who does good Chinese come and rescue me very soon. <laughs> Joy is quite a complicated one. I'll save that one till last, happiness. Uh, something like that. What's the... <laughs> born mindfulness. And concentration. Insight. Um, <laughs> something like that. And... Oh dear, letting go, I've no idea. Uh, something. Uh, no, so, somebody Chinese, spe uh, good at characters, come up. You know the characters? Come, please. Show me. Give us the character for joy. I write here? Yeah. Right. 
That's what I thought. <laughs> Are there others? <laughs> okay, I almost get. So, yeah, I used to love watching Tai do the Chinese characters, so I've always wanted to have a go on the board. <laughs> Um, there's not, I don't know if there's that much uh, point, in d apart from the fact it's nice to see that we have, uh, we have joy in China too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but these, these are the original words in the Buddhist canons. We have the Pali and we also have the Chinese canons, the, the, the Agamas. And, um, yeah. So it's interesting to see that peace, joy, and happiness are born from these, the practice of mindfulness, concentration, insight, and letting go. Um, so we can say that mindfulness, concentration, insight, and letting go are like, they're a source of, of uh, peace, joy, and happiness. And when we're, Practicing, and then we see it also here, mindfulness giving rise to, to joy. And we also see joy giving rise to conditions to help us concentrate. So the two actually can be, we can have a double arrow. You know, if we let go of a regret, somebody said the absence of a regret, we let go of a regret, we let go of a resentment towards somebody, we release energy, and that energy shows up as joy. We have more aliveness, because when we are, our heart is closed to somebody, we also we think we're, in a way, punishing that person, blocking them out of our heart, but we're punishing ourselves. We're enclosing our heart to somebody we're losing some of our life energy availability and we're, we're locked up there. So when we can let go of a resentment, we can release energy and we get more joy. So it goes the other way too, of course. So that's, that, so that, that's actually that direction, the born from letting go. So letting go, we get joy, we see how that works. And also the other way around, if we generate joy and happiness, we've, we're more generous of heart. Yeah? We have more space. Somebody said inner space. We have more inner space to be generous of heart and to, to forgive and forget, we say, to let go. And we get a sort of perspective where we say, okay, we can let that go. So it goes the other way. And when we look at uh, peace, joy, and happiness put together, we see that they are somehow one thing. It's not, they're not separate. They're sort of somehow, in, in this context, they're indivisible. When we have the term excitement going with joy, it's that's slightly less connected with the feeling of peace. So it's somehow going as... But when we put them together like that, we see... There is this one thing we can call peace, joy, and happiness. And when I think of, uh, you know, my experience with Tai and watching him teach, uh, he, I once told my cousin who came to, to visit, you know, you must go to the front and watch Tai from the front. And uh, so he, he, he did, he was just 20 years old and his first time to see Tai. And he came back, he didn't know why I'd insisted that he sit at the front, you know, but it was in Germany, it was at the EIAB. And he came back and he said, that must be the happiest man I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. And he got it from the, just the, the, the light from Tai's eyes, you know, the expression of, of happiness and joy. But to say Tai was not a peace was not peaceful, you know, so there was this peace, happiness and joy embodied in Tai. Uh, 
I mean, there is rather. Even, you know, recently we were looking at a video of Tai um, in his wheelchair now, and he was doing calligraphy, and there's so much joy that Tai has, you know, accesses all the time. Even he can be uh, going through a very difficult time physically. So we know when we see uh, peace, joy and happiness together embodied in someone, it gives us quite a lot of faith in that person. We feel they've, they've got something. Maybe they've got something I want. <laughs> you know, and we, we feel like, yeah, I would like to go in that direction. So, um, I'm going to bring in another teaching now, which also has joy in it. And it was also mentioned when you guys uh, came up with all of the, the words. So there's a teaching of the four limitless minds, classical teaching. And that is, we can say love and friendship, brotherhood, Compassion. Joy. And this letting go again, or often it has many translations, so equanimity, letting go, non-discrimination, and inclusiveness. These are all words which help us really understand what is uh, the true meaning, a deeper meaning to a deeper meaning to this uh, word, which is upeksha in the the Sanskrit. And this word mudita has the, a Sanskrit word of mudita of joy is mudita. Sorry, compassion is karuna. And love and the friendship, the loving kindness sometimes is my tree. So, the four limitless minds in the classical teachings have these aspects. And although there are separate words, piti and mudita, there must be a connection. This, this kind of joy is the sort of joy that we um, we share with other people. So somebody said sharing. It's the joy that is about in, in the, is in relationships, um, but also with ourselves. So we experience joy, whether it, we call it pity or mudita. We have an experience of joy, of life energy, and naturally. Uh, we feel connected, connected to life in us, around us, and of course with people. And in that sort of state, it's very easy to feel joyful for somebody else's joy, to share in each other's joy, and to want to offer joy. And this is why we can say that if these are minds of the mind of love, then offering joy is to offer love. And we just offer joy by our joyfulness, by our being present and in our place of, of being joy. Not, uh, it's not an exclusive joy, it's an inclusive joy. So these go together. It's not a joy that ignores suffering, but it has compassion in it. And really, when we talk about the seven factors of enlightenment, it's like, you know, the G G7, the great seven. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and we may invite another member to become part of this G7 and call it the G G8. And we could put compassion in here, for instance. 
for me, compassion goes, goes in here. How can compassion not be a factor of enlightenment? Compassion is also an aspect of enlightenment. But it's okay. Um, and I, but it, because, actually, when I look deeply into what mindfulness is, it engenders it, it has in it already compassion. Because the, what mindful, the principles of practicing mindfulness have that spirit of embracing, taking care of, and being one with. So we're invited to, you know, when you become aware of your body, you're aware of your body in your body. You become one with the object of your mindfulness. And there is a, when we think about being compassionate, it's got the same quality. You really put yourself in the shoes of, whether it's yourself, you really put yourself in your own shoes, here I am, I'm compassionate with myself, or you put yourself in the other person's shoes. It's like becoming one with them so that you get what is going on for them, what is their situation from their perspective, from within. And that is the invitation um, in the, the sutra where the seven factors is, is, uh, is offered. The Satipatthana, the, the mind, Satipatthana Sutra is the four establishments of mindfulness. And we're invited to practice mind, to be with uh, our body, be with our feelings, be with our mind in such a way that we are in, that we are really uh, not, not like trying to be an observer and separate, but being in. So, compassion is engendered in, in this quality of mindfulness, of this kind attention. And we know from the, the diagram of the, the consciousness, store consciousness here, Supposing we have a seed of suffering, let's say maybe some anger, and we invite the seed of mindfulness to come, then the image we are given is that mindfulness is like a zone of energy that has the capacity to embrace. So when the seed of anger that is in all of us, but latent, when it comes up and it's alive for us, we're experiencing it. The practice is to bring the seed of mindfulness up at the same time in order to embrace that emotion and somewhat become one with it, but with this energy of compassion and being present, but with stability and freedom and not getting... You know, and if the zone of energy of mindfulness is, needs to be enough to embrace, you see it's bigger than the, the anger in this, in this diagram. So, that is... Uh, thank you. <laughs> So the practice of cultivating joy. This is about cultivating the, our mind, taking care of 
the, um, the suffering <coughs> and tra transforming it finally into peace and joy. And that is sort of the, what we're here to do, transform our suffering into peace and joy. And we've talked about some of the sources of joy through the practice. Practicing mindfulness, concentration, the insights that we get can give us joy. The insight that I am alive, that you are here with, as my friend, that, that we have a healthy body. So this is giving attention to also gratitude for good conditions can touch our joy. Um, and if we want to make an offering of peace uh, in the world, maybe this week, we want to do it immediately, uh, we want to make a gift of peace, we could also choose to, that person who we may be complaining about in our mind, and we can consider that person with more compassion and wish to offer them joy. We could look deeply into maybe how, what our responsibility is in the difficulty, how we could contribute to, yeah, to a better communication and how we can, yeah, let go of some of the resentment to free up the energy of joy for them, give them more space in our heart and also therefore for ourselves. That is a, a real way to offer peace to the world, for instance, yeah. There's a, um, a Christmas carol by Charles Dickens. You know, have you ever heard of it? They make it into films sometimes. Ebenezer Scrooge. And I was thinking of it when uh, we have the, the word joy up there and how joy connects to generosity. So this man that was very grumpy um, and didn't even give his employees a lazy day uh, I think he allowed them Christmas because he sort of had to or something, but he just wanted them to work. And he was very, very grumpy and miserable. And on the Christmas Eve, is it Christmas Eve? The ghosts come and grab him. The ghosts of Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future. And they basically show him the results of his grumpiness, of his miserly, stingy, yeah, he was, he was like miserable, uh, stingy and miserly with his love and his money. And they show him the effects of this. Um, and he gets to see like that. It's like, uh, I think we would say he's seeing his karma or something. <laughs> and um, he gets a second chance because he wakes up in the morning and all he wants to do is uh, go in the opposite direction and offer his, his generosity and uh, his love. So sometimes we, uh, this is a, f a kind of funny story, but it shows that this, the connection in that story for me is also about how uh, being generous and joyful are so connected, that we have a generosity of, of uh, our heart, and we, we give freely. We give our joy, and it comes from a place of uh, deep peace in us, and appreciation, a place of gratitude. And um, this is an offering of, of love. So, the talk uh, this morning is hopefully to 
remind us of the central place of nourishing joy and peace in our practice and the connection between joy and peace. And yeah, we can think of many ways in which we can um, concretely, practically generate moments of joy among us and inside us that we can uh, also become more peaceful and liberate more energy to, of this kind to, to offer. So I will end there because it's time. Uh, and hopefully through the day we have, if the weather allows, there will be a walking meditation on the schedule. And we can, Thai often invites us with every step to touch our peace with every step, to offer peace back to Mother Earth. And our mindfulness energy of becoming present for ourselves and offering um, our love and our peace, this mindfulness energy um, is something we bring to protect ourselves and if we're offering it to the earth we're also having the desire to protect the earth and it has the um, energy of connection, of feeling connected and the joy of feeling connected to life. So we're invited to enjoy our steps. Enjoying our steps and offering peace with each step in the same, in the same uh, spirit. So thank you for your kind attention and look forward to uh, more generating the practice of mindfulness, joy, insight together. <laughs>